Welcome to First Book, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's good to have you with us. This week we're looking at a passage which demonstrates extravagant love and grace being showered on Jesus as he prepares to go to the cross. But before we begin to look at that, if you haven't done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this study. And you'll find the link for that in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so, without further ado, let's dive into today's passage, which comes from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Jesus had arrived in Bethany, which, as we learn in verse 18 of chapter 11, is a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. And we know that he was on his way to the festival of Passover, because in verses 55 to 57 of that chapter, there was speculation about whether he would still go to the festival after he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus had wept outside the tomb of his friend as he called him to come out, and Lazarus had been dead by that point for four days. Now, it was believed at that time that once you'd been dead for at least three days, you were really dead. And the body would be starting to decompose, there would have been an almighty stink. That bit of background is really important, what we find in verses 1 to 44 of chapter 11, if we're to make complete sense of what's going on in today's reading in chapter 12. Now we also know from the previous chapter that while the events of that day had led some people to trust in Jesus and desire to follow him, Others had not liked what they'd seen, and they, having been with Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, then went off to the Pharisees, among the ruling Jewish elite of the time, and told them what they'd seen and what had happened. And we know, looking at the section of chapter 11 from verses 45 through to 53, that there was a council called that included the chief priests who um, were the guardians of the Jerusalem temple establishment and some of these Pharisees. And we know that in that discussion, Caiaphas, who was the elected high priest of that time, though actually appointed by Rome, um, in this instance declared that it was better for one person to die for the people rather than to have the entirety of the nation put at risk by allowing Jesus to continue what he was doing. And so when in verse 7 of today's reading he speaks of his upcoming burial, this is the kind of background that he has in mind. Consequently, as verse 54 of chapter 11 shows us, he'd been lying low in Ephraim for a few days, which was kind of on the edge of, of the wilderness, out of the way of the action. But six days before the Passover, here in the first verse of today's reading, he'd gone to Bethany to join Mary, Martha and Lazarus. The Passover in John's Gospel is on Good Friday, which is a day later than we find in the earlier Gospels, Mark, Matthew and Luke. And this means, as we see right at the beginning of chapter 13 in verse 1, that Jesus' hour really had finally come. So in this passage, we have quite a variety of figures. We have Lazarus, we're told specifically he was present at this meal, a resident of Bethany who had been dead only a few days beforehand. We have his two sisters, Mary and Martha. The former, as we know, anointed Jesus, and there's a looking ahead to that in chapter 11, verse 2. While we know that Martha... Uh, from verse 2 of today's passage, served at the meal. 
And although the focus here is primarily on the actions of Mary, this is significant in of itself, and I'll say a bit more about that shortly. And we also, as well as Jesus, have his disciples, including but not limited to the Twelve. And specifically, we have Judas Iscariot, who we know would go on to betray Jesus. And we see his going out into the dark to do that in chapter 13, verses 21 to 30, after he has also shared in uh, what we now call the Last Supper. So there's a lot of people present at this startling scene. John's Gospel was the last to be written around 90 to 95 of the Common Era. And by that point, we know there was a real separation going on between uh, Jewish synagogues and Christian gatherings, the early church. And that impacted, I think, a lot of how things are presented here. And particularly when John's Gospel refers to the Jews, it refers to that Jewish establishment with which the Christians of John's day were very much now in conflict. So that does give us a bit of the, the broader picture of what we're thinking about as we engage with this text. And it's fascinating that this account of Jesus being anointed by a woman is one that appears in all four Gospels, in Mark chapter 14, verses 3 to 9, in Matthew 26, verses 6 to 13, and also in Luke chapter 7, so rather earlier on in the narrative, verses 36 to 49. And while they are earlier parallel accounts, there are significant differences between them, particularly in relation to where this event happened and who the woman was. This is the only occasion where we have a really definite identity, I think, in that we have Mary of Bethany. So the other accounts are different. But what I think unites them seemingly is the smell of the perfume filling the house. And I wonder if it was that um, really evocative smell that triggered a memory of something that really did happen historically in the ministry of Jesus, where perhaps has been used for different purposes theologically in the different Gospels. Or maybe points to an event that happened more than once, we can't be sure. But we do know from verse 2 of our reading, having had the scene set for us, that it's six days before Passover, and knowing that we're in Mary, Martha and Lazarus's house, we know that Mary, Martha is the one who served the meal. You hear that in verse 2. And the word that's used to describe her service, diakono, is echoed later on in verse 26 of chapter 12 by Jesus' teaching about servanthood. So while Martha is not the main female character here, she nonetheless, as well as Mary, demonstrates an aspect of discipleship which is really important and central. So it's, it's key that we don't overlook her in this story. But the focus, very obviously, is the anointing of Jesus by Mary. Now, anointing in the ancient world could be done for a variety of different reasons. It could, as we see in Exodus chapter 40, verse 15, and in 1 Samuel 16, verse 12, be done in order to anoint a monarch ready for their reign. It could also, as we see in Mark 6, verse 13, in the letter of James, chapter 5, verse 14, be about healing the sick. And as we see in Mark 16, chapter 1, it could also be about preparing people for burial. And it seems that Mary's actions here in anointing Jesus point to the first and third things, to anointing a new king, as it were, but also preparing Jesus for his burial. In verse 3, we get a lot of the key details of this story. One of them is that the fragrance of the costly perfume that Mary used to anoint Jesus filled the whole house. And its, and its wonderful aroma contrasts very sharply with the odour of death coming from Lazarus's putrid body in chapter 11, verse 39. And as I say, given that all four Gospels have some sort of account of an anointing with perfume, I wonder if it's the smell that's the key that links them here. We're told that Mary wiped Jesus's feet with her hair. 
and the Greek word that's used for wipe, egmaso, is also used in chapter 13, verse 5, when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And I wonder if there's a possibility that Mary's action in caring for Jesus inspired him in turn to perform this act of service for his disciples. Either way, it shows Mary, I think, acting in unity with Jesus and behaving as a model disciple following his commands. And it links, therefore, with chapter 13, verses 8 and then 14 to 15. The wiping of his feet with her hair was not just something that suggests a degree of intimacy between the two, but there's also something of an erotic dimension to it. And certainly we know it went way beyond what was acceptable in terms of how men and women who weren't married to one another would behave. And that brings us very neatly to the interruption of Judas in verse 4. We can speculate about the motive behind what Judas did. And verse 5 suggests that the fundamental issue was that Judas was someone who would steal from the common purse that he'd been charged to look after. And so he was perhaps angry that the perfume wasn't going to be sold for a large amount of money that he could then tap into. But I also wonder if there's something about the extravagant love that Mary pours out on Jesus and the erotic dimension of what she does and he allows her to do that offends Judas very deeply. I wonder if he's deciding he's had enough and he's going to betray Jesus essentially comes out of disgust for what Jesus has allowed Mary to do. Either way, as he helpfully points out for us in verse 5, the perfume that Mary used was extremely expensive and she uses a large amount of it. She uses a whole pound's worth of it. And its worth was, we're told, 300 denarii, which was roughly equivalent to what a labourer could expect to earn in a year. So I suppose if you could convert it in today's money, we're talking about sort of 10 to 15k perhaps, a really significant sum of money behind it. Now, verse 6 tells us that Judas, who we know from chapter 6, verses 70 to 71, had already been branded a devil, is, was also a thief. And it's the only time in the whole of the Gospels that he's described as such. And there's reference again made in chapter 13, verses 29, to his holding of the common purse. And his stinginess, his self-servingness, really contrasts with Mary's extravagant generosity. And the implication of the Greek in verse 7 is less that Mary had specifically got this perfume in order to anoint Jesus, so much as perhaps she found a greater purpose for it than she'd originally intended. Either way, we know that the Greek of verse 7 is quite difficult to translate. But I think what we can say, particularly looking towards chapter 12, verse 27, and chapter 13, verse 1, is that whether Mary had known what she was doing or not, she had indeed prepared Jesus for his coming hour, which in this context means he's going to the cross and being glorified. Um, as John sees it in that really kind of um, counterintuitive way of presenting what might be seen as disaster, as in fact the triumph of God's love. And as verse 32 of chapter 12 says, it's in that lifting up that all would be potentially drawn to Jesus. The passage ends, this little snippet, with a verse that has proven quite controversial down the years in verse 8, when Jesus says, um, basically, you'll always have the poor with you, you won't always have me. Now, he's not, as some have argued down the years, saying effectively, poverty is inevitable, so concentrate on the spiritual side of life. Don't be interested in alleviating poverty and tackling its causes. It would run contrary to uh, what we find in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11, where being generous towards those who are poor is actively commanded in the law of Moses. Now, what I think is going on here is more that there's a contrast that's being drawn between the unyielding, rigid piety 
advocated by Judas for whatever reason, and the wild, extravagant love of Mary. So this is a fascinating passage. So there are other versions in later Gospels that are different in their details, and it's worthwhile comparing and contrasting the four accounts. But either way, however we look at this, it seems to point towards wild, extravagant love. And that's the same wild, extravagant love that was shown to Jesus that he would demonstrate for all of us in going to the cross and then rising again three days later. And so as we continue through our journey towards Holy Week and to the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, it's worth taking some time as we grapple with our questions to also reflect on God's extravagant love in our own lives and times. <laughs>